the last time we stopped at Revelation chapter 14 and about verse 8, where it talks about the first two angels' messages. We saw we spent some time talking about the the first message that says the hour of God's judgment has come. And the second message that talks about the fall of Babylon. We were just about to look at the third message when we ran out of time. So this evening, we're going to start directly at the third message. And we're going to proceed from there. But just to remind us quickly about the, the first two messages, what we saw is that the hour of God's judgment has arrived with the arrival of the mark of the beast crisis. At this time, God, God's people are awakened to a great revival. And there are, there are three emphases to the message, the message that they are to carry. Number one says that the hour of God's judgment has arrived. It is the moment in time that has been ordained by God from ages past to bring the world to a point of decision. As I pointed out, every day, individual people are being faced with choices. Every day, children are being born. Every day, people are dying. And we could say, in a sense, people are making decisions every day. But it's like when you're going to school, there are always little tests along the way. And sometimes teacher, the teacher will mark your individual book. But there comes a day when there is an examination for the entire class, sometimes for the entire school. And on that day, everybody comes knowing that this is my day of testing. Sometimes your future destiny depends upon that test. In a way, this is what the mark of the beast crisis is like. It's, it's, it's God saying there's, a, there's a, an examination day for the world. When I'm going to bring the world to such a place that children won't be born to make another generation that needs to be tested again. Some won't get tested and then another group come along who needs to be tested afterwards. God says, I am bringing, I'm allowing a crisis to come upon the entire planet that everybody comes to the examination at one time so that when it is over, there's no need for a second run. Nobody gets left out. Nobody escapes uh, the, the, the microscope. Everybody will display in this last great test, even though there are 8 billion people on the planet. Now, the only exception I can see is if you are a little baby, one year old or so. I mean, those will, will be like babies who die very young. They are too young to make a choice. Those who are too young to make any rational choice, they are the only exceptions I see to this judgment. There's somebody who's an imbecile, like, you know, somebody who was born and grown without any understanding. But other than that, every person on the planet will be brought to judgment. Because there, there, are, there are a few reasons for this. One of the reasons is this. First of all, there are people who, they could become Christians, but the circumstances, they've never been put in a place where they, they were brought face to face with their need to serve God. What a crisis does is it, 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 it pushes you towards the direction that you are taking. For example, there, 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 is, there are about 60 something of us in the room this evening. Let us say this was a motley group where there were non Christians, there were Christians, and there were all kinds of people. If all of us come to the moment where we are facing death, let us say somebody is about to release a bomb in the room or to release some poison gas, and we are all locked up in the room. And we have 12 hours. 12 hours before we die. In those 12 hours, we are going to see what every person is made up of. You get enough time. Everybody gets enough time to make up his mind. Everybody gets enough time to, to go in the direction that he's heading. You know what happened? Some people will kill themselves. You know what happened? Some people will fight until the last moment. Some people will take the weeping and bawling. You know what will happen also? Some people will take the, the occasion to make things right with God. The Christians will become stronger. 
Those who are leaning towards God will become Christians. Those who are going in the other direction will become stronger. Some will rail and curse God. It's like I heard a story here in Jamaica. A, a car went over a precipice with a, with a, a group of Rasta men in there. And, um, you know, they, 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 they survived. And they, one of them jumped out and said, we're a lion. We can't dead. Okay. Meaning we're, we're lions. We can't die. He, he, they, they just came out with the same spirit that they went in with. And you, you, you've heard stories like this, but it is true. God allows the world to be locked into a, an environment of peril and that demands something of every person on the planet. And he gives us, as it were, an hour, a period of time, maybe a few weeks, and I don't know how long, maybe a couple of years, that everybody can examine and investigate and look at the issues and decide for himself, how do I deal with this? Every person alive. That is what the mark of the beast crisis is about. It's an opportunity to make, to choose uh, and to strengthen the direction you are going in life. Finally, irrevocably. So at the end of it, every person on the planet will have had his opportunity and will have made his decision. <coughs> God can close the door and can say, everybody had the chance. I can seal this planet once and for all and forever. It never happened before because a crisis came upon the Jews. The, 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 the people of the rest of the world was there. It came upon America. The rest of the world was there. <laughs> people got into a little challenge in the destruction of Jerusalem. The rest of the world was there. But God is allowing it to come upon the entire planet so that that will be it. So that's the hour of God's judgment. It's a judgment not just of the people of the world, but also it's a revelation of the kingdom of God, as we pointed out. I'm not going to go back over all that again this evening. And the second message was that the fall of Babylon represented the final apostasy of the religious bodies of the Christian denominations. That's, that's the second thing that the, the, the crisis does, this great test exposes these denominations and pushes them in the direction they have been going. And that is why God says to his people, come out of her, my people. All of us in this, in this room, we are aware that something is going on in the Anglican church right now. Anglican church in England, Sister Rachel, right now that um, is kind of playing this out or showing us how it will play out. The Anglican church in England has legitimized gay, uh, gay alliances, gay relationships by saying they will bless such relationships, even though they may not uh, have official church marriages for them. Why is the Anglican church doing this? Because it is popular. Why? Because the, the powers that be, the authorities have legitimized it. The world is heading in that direction. Anywhere in the planet you go, they are legitimizing this, although the African countries are giving them a fight. And if you intend to survive as a government-approved institution, you must take the direction of the authorities. And the Church of England is smelling the direction that things are going. And they are making sure that they are safe. This is an example of how the mark of the beast will play out in those religious bodies. As I said last time, the only people who will survive are the people who they are not affiliated to these institutions. They are people who are individual Christians. Their relationship with God is based on personal fellowship, personal relationship. They don't follow people. They don't follow men. They don't follow David Clayton. They don't follow Open Face Fellowship. We enjoy the association. But the person you are bound to is Jesus Christ. And so if I try to, to take you down, down, down the, the wrong pathway, you know that you don't follow David Clayton. Okay? But when people become associated to institutions, it's a formula for mass destruction. People become associated with groups and, 
and institutions and denominations. That's the danger of denominationalism. That's the, that's the danger of Babylon. And that's why Babylon goes down. When Babylon goes down, everybody inside goes down. Because by membership and association, you become accountable. People, the, the problem with, with people in Babylon is that they have never learned to think for themselves. They join themselves to institutions, and those institutions don't train you to think. They don't train you to be independent Christians. They teach you how to submit to church authority and how to listen to the people in charge and how to allow the priests and the ministers to make decisions for you. And so the time comes when the church says, this is how we have to go, brethren and sisters. We have sanctified this thing. We have accepted it because God loves everybody. And so everybody inside goes along. You know what is interesting to me? It's interesting to me that when I look at the reform reforms of the past, you know what is the thing that's interesting and that kind of distresses me? Look at the names of the reformers. Martin Luther, John Huss, Jerome, um, Tyndale, Latimer, Wycliffe, John, John Wesley. What do you notice about all these people? I'm going to tell you what I noticed. They were all leaders in the churches. You know why? Because the common people were never able to think for themselves enough to raise up any, 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 any reformation. The common people were followers. It took another leader in the church. It took another so-called theologian or leader to, to raise up rebellion because the common people never could think for themselves. So while the reformation was a wonderful thing, that stands out in my mind. That stands out clearly that they, 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 um, from among the common people, probably the only time it ever happened was at Pentecost, right? And I think, I think the theologians took over from the common people after a short while in the Council of Jerusalem. You have the, the scribes, the, you have the Pharisees, the believing Pharisees, take over the meeting. Take over the meeting and want to talk about who, whether they must keep, be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. But Jesus started the church. The only theologian among the lot was Paul, and he came years afterwards. It's, it's the only what you might call really grassroots revival because all the others are started, were started by prominent ministers in the churches because they never taught the common people to think for themselves. They put their trust in the ministers. And so even the reformations had to be started by people who were ministers. Just an interesting um, point that I, 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 I wanted to point out. So. This evening, we, we, we move on to the third message, which is going to take us more time than the other two. And the reason is that, as, as all of us know, most of us have grown up with a, the, the focus on the third angel's message. And yes, it is, in, it, is, it is the most significant because Revelation 13 is about it and Revelation 14, the, the three messages, in fact, are based upon this particular message. So we're going to take some time to look at it. And of course, I'm always going to go to my Bible. I'm going to go to the Bible first of all. All right, so we go to Revelation. And we're going to start in chapter 14. We finished the first eight verses. It says Babylon is fallen, is fallen. We looked at this already. So let's go now to verse nine. It says, and the third angel followed them. That's the, the third angel followed the first two angels. Saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Let me pause here. Now, this is a frightening sentence. It, it, 
any way you interpret it, it's frightening. But if you if you interpret it in a superficial way, it might be doubly frightening because it, it, it gives you an idea of God, which most people embrace. It says God is going to torment these people who have the mark of the beast. He's going to torment them with fire and brimstone in the presence of angels and in the presence of Jesus. So you're frightened because of the sentence and you're frightened to know that God is that kind of person. You have a double fright. So the first thing I want to remind us of is that the book of Revelation is a symbolic book. First thing to remember, when you are reading Revelation, your default position is that it is a symbol. That's your default position. If it really represents something realistic, that is the unusual position where Revelation is concerned. Revelation is written in a symbolic form. So right away, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say that this is a sim symbolic representation. It's not saying God is going to roast anybody with fire and brimstone and they're going to be roasted forever and ever. We're going to look at that more closely in just a moment. But let's go back up to verse 9 and start there. So the third angel follows the, fir the first two angels. And um, again, I want to remind us that the ministry of these angels is not referring to the ministry of literal angels. These angels represent God's human messengers. Last week, we looked at it and we saw that angels have not been commissioned to preach the gospel. In the book of Revelation, especially when a message comes from heaven, God represents it as coming by an angel. But if you read these passages, you will see that it is always the people of God who actually carry the messages. So it's represented by an angel. Now it says again, remember that the first angel said with a loud voice. It says again that this third angel follows again and he says with a loud voice. And what are we to imply from a loud voice? Well, when you talk with a loud voice, it means that you want everybody to hear. So there, there is a message in every word that God has put here. So when he says the angel cries with a loud voice, God is trying to say to us that the message that is to be carried by God's people at this time is extraordinary in that it impacts every person who is living on the planet. It's a loud voice. And we already saw that the, these messages are to be preached to those who live on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So it goes to every nation and it goes with a loud voice, meaning that everybody is to hear these messages. And it, it, it's not to go by the process of you sitting in your, in your yard and giving a good example, okay? You live good with your neighbors and you say, I live a Christian life, that's my witness. You go on the street and you tell everybody good morning and you're polite to them. And if a beggar begs you some money, you give the beggar. So you live a Christian life and people can see by your, your fruits that you're a Christian. This is not how this message goes. It goes with a loud voice, meaning that this is no message that is carried by simply living a passive Christian life. God's people are electrified by what happens on planet Earth, they are electrified. And the sleeping virgins awaken out of their slumber. They trim their lamps and the light begins to burn bright. I would say to you that up to this time, God's people have been living the life of the sleeping virgins who have their lights burning. Our lights are flickering. Thank God, they're not dead. But there's no blazing light. There's no loud voice, but and God shows us that this crisis, he's accomplishing more than one purpose through this crisis. So they have a loud voice. They proclaim the message. And, and you know, if you want to think about it practically, what happens at that time? I believe that every one of us, the situation that is coming, we are going to give up our jobs. Or we are going to kick out, be kicked out of our jobs. If you have to, have the mark of the beast in order to buy or sell. How many of you think you're going to be still in your job? Everybody who's who has a mark is going to be in his job. He's going to be safe. Everybody who has a mark. The rest of you won't have to worry about 
your job anymore. And some, I believe, will get out when they see what is coming. They won't even wait to be kicked out. But if you wait, you certainly won't have a job. And so what will you spend your time doing? Knitting, planting flowers, weeding your garden? No. God's people are going to dedicate and devote themselves to preaching the gospel. Some will end up in jail. Some will end up being beaten. Some might even lose their lives. But the message will go with a loud voice. That's what the word of God promises, and we believe the word of God. So the message is, okay, it seems like, what is that? All right. I don't know. I get a little weeping. I don't know if somebody was trying to call me or somebody else. But anyway, it said, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead on his right hand, it's just simply repeating what we saw in Revelation 13. It's really showing you that the real crisis, the real critical issue is worshiping the beast and the image and receiving the mark. Now, let me remind us of something. I've, I've tried to emphasize that the beast is an old world power from Europe. And the image of the beast is a new world power in America. So the whole world is covered, the old world and the new world. And I suppose places like China and Russia and Korea will fall into place. I don't know how. The world has not yet finished reconfiguring itself. So one of the things I noticed that is happening now is that on the political scene, certain countries are bringing themselves together to form a coalition, and they are, they are standing up against America and England and the, the, the currency system. And it seems like the world order is being changed. But based on prophecy, as much as I would like to see it happen, based on prophecy, I don't think it's going to happen. Because according to prophecy, if, if we interpret it properly, and I believe we have been looking at it using proper principles of interpretation, based on it, I believe that the old world European beast will remain dominant there, and the new world American beast will remain dominant here. That's why between the both of them, they are able to impose the mark upon everybody. So God warns, if you worship the beast or the image, and you know, there's been a lot of talk about um, the open elements of Satan worship that are in the world today. All right, they, they, they made this, image of the, the the beast down there at the, the was it the olympics in england or one of these games and there's a recent one going around of them having carnival in brazil glorifying satan and you you know they're doing these things and this is alarming but i just want to remind us all that when the bible talks about worshiping in the book of revelation it's not focusing on these primitive and super superficial forms of worship in the book of revelation worship has to do with uh, let me just mute everybody in the book of revelation worship has to do with giving your loyalty to somebody above god it's not this the, the 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 little gross caricatures like somebody dresses up like Satan or somebody goes I mean it's 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 distasteful, it's horrible, it's pagan, but this is not what the Bible is focusing on. It's focusing on the more subtle forms of worship because believe me, the people in the churches who call upon the name of, Je of Jehovah or even Yahweh and even make sure that there are no images in their churches and they give their they give their loyalty to the pastor or to the denomination or to somebody over God don't you believe that the Satan worshiper the one who is jumping around in Brazil with those little images don't you believe that there are more idolaters than this person is than the other person is they're just more deceived in their idolatry 
what Satan is interested in is in cutting your association with God by any means possible. And sometimes he'll do it in a gross way. And sometimes it's a more subtle way. It doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, the more subtle way works better for him. Because there's nobody who is more, more, more powerfully in the, in, the, in the camp of Satan than the person who sits in church while he's doing it. And if, I, if, you, if you want me to give you an example of this, I will just ask you, who were the, the, the people who killed Jesus? Who you blame more, the, the Roman pagans or the religious Jews? Which one you blame more? The Romans were pawns with all their idolatrous symbols, their Roman eagles and their worship of, of Jove and the other Roman gods. The, 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 the real evil people who Jesus called children of the devil, who instigated the crucifixion of Jesus, they were the religious people who called the name of God and in every other way appeared to be worshiping Jehovah while they were, according to Jesus, they were the children of Satan. They were in the greatest danger because they were doing it under religious guise. So I just want to make the point that it's not any different in the end of time. The worshiping of the beast and his image is not necessarily the gross outward forms. What we are looking at here is the more subtle, the kind of worship that it involves people rejecting God while they are using the name of God. So it, is the, it says, again, they receive his mark in the forehead or in the hand. And um, as we pointed out before, I believe, I agree with the idea that in the forehead represents that they intellectually accept the idea behind the mark. While in the hand, I agree. It's kind of obvious. It means that they may not intellectually agree with it, but they cooperate. You use your hand. Your hand is, is a place of activity. Like it says, Jesus sat at God's right hand. Like it says that um, my, my right hand has gained me the victory. It, it's, it's, the, the hand represents the, the thing that you use to work or to perform or to function. So to receive the mark in the hand means that you function or you operate in harmony with the mark, even if you don't agree with it, while those in the forehead means that you are intellectually on board. Bear those two things in mind. Now, what is this mark? Is the million dollar question. If I knew the answer for sure, I might be the most famous pe person in the world, or I might be the most hated, because I'm sure that this mark is something that will be popular on the planet. I'm sure of that. I'm sure that everybody is going to receive this mark. It is so popular, everybody is going to receive it, whether with a hand or the forehead, except for a lunatic few. So if I knew the mark for sure, I'd probably be more likely to be hated than to be loved. But at the same time, I'm going, we're going to examine it and I'm going to share with you the, 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 the pointers I see in the Bible. One of the things I ask God for, just between you and me, brothers and sisters, I ask God for understanding of a few things. And I think he, he's blessing me. I think he's answering my prayer. I ask God to help me to understand. All right, let me start with the one that I don't yet have an answer to. I ask him to help me to understand the king of the north and the king of the south in Daniel 11. I'd like to know that. I don't have an answer yet. I ask him to help me to understand why is it that there are so many terrible things that happen and he doesn't intervene to put a stop. And he has given me very good understanding of that issue. He has helped me to understand in a way that I, I am satisfied and I can satisfy most people with the answer he gave me. And I'm asking him to help me to understand what is the mark of the beast? Now, I think he has given me some very good understanding in that area. 
but I, I still always hesitate a little bit. Meaning that I do, I'm not, I, I can't say 100%. And I, I still am asking for if there's anything more that he could say to say. If I don't get anything more, then I, I will know when it comes. But at the moment, I would say I am 90% confident. But <laughs> I'm saying all of this because I want you all to know that I am not in the process of trying to deceive you. All right, I'm very anxious that everybody should know. I'm giving you the best that I have. I'm giving you the best that I have. But if I have a, a, an element of uncertainty, I want to be fair and let you know there's that element of uncertainty so that we are all together in the same position. All right? So, this mark of the beast. Wow. Let me start with where. <laughs> It started for me. First question. I'm going to have to go to the Bible. I'm going to have to go to my chart. All right. Let me go to my chart because I want to start at the, at the beginning, which is the question of where Who is the beast? That's the number one question. Now, let me bring up this diagram. All right, I hope we can all see the diagram. This diagram is a representation of the beast in Revelation 17. And if you notice what the, the title says, it says the mark belongs to the beast, not the woman. Now, here in Revelation 17, you see two entities. You see the woman and you have the beast. The woman is riding the beast. Now, we know that the woman, Babylon, we have identified this woman. I have identified this woman, whether everybody agrees or not. My identification is that the woman represents the religious bodies, the fallen religious bodies that God's people are to be warned to come out of. So who is the beast? Because the woman is riding the beast or the beast is carrying the woman. In my understanding, the beast represents the political powers of the old world, and in, in particular, the powers of Europe. So we, we have the, the, the Roman Catholic Church and her daughters in a close, idolatrous relationship, a, a, adulterous relationship with the political powers of Europe, although the, the romance is dying, because I understand that in Europe right now, the churches are being sold out to nightclubs and things like that. Reli Christianity is dying in Europe. So the, 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 the romance between the woman and the beast is dying. But the point is, the mark is the mark of the beast. It's not a religious mark. It's not a mark that belongs to the woman. It's a mark that belongs to the secular beast. So. I'm saying this because there are religious people who believe that the mark has to do with the day that you worship. I used to believe this. What I believe today, even if I'm wrong about it, I still don't believe it has to do with a day of worship. I don't believe it because it is not the woman's mark. It is a beast's mark. So the beast is a secular power, not a religious power. The religious power is riding the beast. And according to Revelation 17, those 10 horns that we see on the beast are going to turn against the woman, eat her flesh, make her naked, and burn her with fire. That's in Revelation 17. So the political powers of Europe are going to turn against the churches in Europe, particularly the Roman Catholic Church, and they are going to eat her flesh, make her naked, burn her with fire. So the mark is the mark of the, the, the beast, not the mark of the woman. So who is this beast? Well, I, I have concluded that this, this beast represents a godless power, a power that is not only without God, but that is against God. And why do I come to this conclusion? Because this beast makes war against God's people, and this beast makes war against the, 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 the harlot woman. So the beast makes war against false religion, 
and it makes war against God's religion. So does it have any religion? If it attacks false religion, which has been riding, riding it for, for ages, then it hates religion. And it turns against true religion, and it tries to destroy God's people. It is against all religion. So I conclude that the beast is a, is a non-religious power. Do I see anything in the world today that, that is leaning in the direction of this beast? Absolutely. You look at, you look at extreme communism, extreme Marxism. Communism is anti-religion. Now, somebody will say their religion is science or their religion is, um, they have a religion which is atheism or whatever, maybe technically, but I'm speaking in the simplest sense. Atheism is against religion, they're against God, and they're against religion, whether it is Roman Catholicism or the Adventist Mar Jehovah's Witness, they're against any religion that talks about God, period. So I identify this beast as a secular power, maybe even an atheistic power. When I look at Europe today, I am convinced that that is the direction Europe is taking. America is following too, and Canada too. They're taking every mention of God out of all their legal institutions and the, the, the secular lobby groups, the American Civil Liberties Union, and similar groups in other countries. They're making sure that there's no sniff or mention of God in any of the decisions that are taken. This beast is a secular, godless political entity that, that, that is to dominate that part of the world, Europe and the whole world. While the United States does the same thing in our part of the world. I don't have to take you through all the news items for you to recognize this is exactly what is happening. So what is my point? My point is that the mark of the beast has to do with something that is secular in nature. It's not something religious. It's something secular, yet it is of such a nature that it will test religious people. Now, all I want to know if you are going to answer me or respond, if you think what I just said does not make any sense, you can stop me. For no other reason, but if you think it doesn't make sense, stop me. I want to hear your opinion if you think it doesn't make sense. Because the way I just outlined it to you, to my limited thinking, it seems to make perfect sense. So this is where my understanding is different from the understanding I grew up with, that it was a religious mark, and it's one religious group against another religious, religious group. When I examine the prophecy carefully, no. I see the mark of the beast as a mark of the secular power, particularly Europe adopted by America, but it's secular Europe, not religious Europe. It's something that will be used to persecute Christians and it will test even non-Christians if they don't conform. Now let's go back to the Bible. Let's go back to that statement. Brother David. Yes, it's Anita. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but can you give us a deep, deeper meaning of the secular? Because I want to understand you fully. Can you give us that deeper meaning of the secular? What you're talking about? Okay. okay? Thank you. Okay, Sister Anita. The, the word secular is used always as a contrast to religious. Whatever is not religious is labeled as secular. So secular means means having to do with aspects of life that are not religious. So they would put religion in a category of church worship, Bible study, worship services, moral commitment in, our, in the religious setting. Secular has to do with the laws that govern the society and the principles that run a society that are not based on your religious convictions. So, that, so, so that's the idea of secular. So, Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, Sister Anita. Now, here's where I picked up a clue that began to push me in a certain direction. From my perspective, I believe God led me here. People don't have to agree, but I believe God led me in answer to my prayer because I've never heard anybody on the planet who ever 
look at this prophecy in this way. This is entirely a figment of my imagination or the directing of the Spirit of God. Okay, one or the other. But it's not something that um, I picked up by listening to somebody else because I've never heard up to this day anybody else who, who sees it like this. But I'll explain. Now, it says, it, it, it tells you that those who worship the beast and his mark and receive his mark are going to be punished in a certain way. I learned something about interpreting Revelation and let me share it with you. Revelation is written in the language of the Old Testament. So when you come upon things in Revelation, one helpful approach is to see if it uses Old Testament language. Then you go to that place in the Old Testament and you study what happened. And it helps you to understand what is happening in Revelation. I'm going to give you an example. When the Bible says in Revelation 16, it talks about the, the seven plagues. And it says one of the plagues is, listen to this. It says that the angel poured his vial upon the river Euphrates. And the waters of the river were dried up to make way for the kings from the east. Now, if you know anything about the destruction of Babylon, you know what that means. When Babylon was destroyed in the days of King Belshazzar, two kings came from the east. They were King Darius and King Cyrus. Darius was the king of the Medes, and Cyrus was the king of the Persians, and they formed an alliance and they came against Babylon. Now they came from the east. And what they did was they dried up the waters of the river Euphrates. I don't know if you're aware that this happened in history. What they did was the river Euphrates ran under the city of Babylon. So the Babylonians locked all the gates. Nobody could get in. The walls were huge. Nobody could break down the walls. So they went to bed. They didn't go to bed. They were having a party that night. Everybody was contented. You know what happened? Darius and Cyrus dried up the river and walked in the riverbed under the walls of the city and got into the city. There were some other walls inside, but those, those, those gates were left open for the inner walls. And they walked through those walls straight into Babylon like they were on a red carpet, welcome mat. And they conquered Babylon that night. So the kings from the east dried up the river Euphrates to prepare the way for the kings from the east. How they dried up the river, they, they, every soldier in the army got a stone and threw it in the river. And they kept on throwing stones till the river was blocked up. And it, they led it off in another direction. So the river they dried up. That's how Babylon was overthrown. Now God uses the same exact imagery talking about the seven last plagues. And he says, the river Euphrates is dried up to make way for the kings of the east. If you are really silly, you're like these people who are watching the Middle East and they say, look here, the river Euphrates is drying up. Prophecy is being fulfilled. You can forgive these people. They don't understand what they're reading. God is talking about a different kind of river and a different kind of Babylon and a different kind of drying up. People represent, a uh, river represents the multitudes of people and the, the river of people that support Babylon represents the multitudes that support Babylon. But God says the river Euphrates is dried up. He means that the support for Babylon is going to dry up. God's people are going to come out of Babylon. The, the 10 kings are going to turn against Babylon. The support is dried up. And Babylon is overthrown in preparation for the coming of the king from the east. And who is the king from the east? It's Jesus Christ. So you can understand the prophecy in the real way, but you learn something by looking at the Old Testament. So in the same way, the thought came to me, is there any place in the Old Testament that we can find this happening to anybody? Somebody tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the angels and in the presence of Christ? And the smoke of the torment going up forever and ever? Wow, I asked the question and I got an answer. I got an answer. Now I'm going to bring up the answer 
in my left panel, or maybe I should bring it up in the right panel. Let me bring it up in the right panel and I'll, I'll keep Revelation in the left panel. I'm going to go to the book of Genesis and um, I'll tell you the chapter in just a minute. It might have been about chapter. I'll find a chapter in just a moment. It's not at my, yeah, here it is. Chapter 18. Chapter 19. All right, what do we find in, 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 in chapter 19? We find angels. Two angels came to Sodom at evening. You know the story of Sodom. There's only one place in the Bible that was tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of angels and in the presence of Jesus Christ. Only one place in the Bible. It was the destruction of Sodom. Now it says there were two angels that came to Sodom. But what we see from chapter 18 is that there were three men. There were three men who appeared to Abraham. And while two of them were angels, one of them was the, was the Lord himself. Because Abraham walked with him and began to argue with him and to ask him to sp if, he, if he couldn't spare Sodom. And the Lord told him that if he found 10 righteous in the city, he would spare the city. He said, I will not destroy it for 10 sake. So the Lord was there and we know that this Lord was not God the Father. It was the Son of God in his pre-incarnate condition. So the Lord was there. The Lamb was there. And the other two were two angels. And it says that the next, the, that evening, the two angels came to Sodom. Of course, we know the story of how the two angels, were, the, the men of the city tried to rape the two angels and Lot took them in and the angels had to smite the people with blindness. But the, 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 the telling part of it is that the next morning, the first time and the only time in the history of the world God rained fire and brimstone upon, upon a group of people on this planet. They were tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels. And as we see, Jesus was also present. Now it says, the, the next part says, the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. Now, again, when I look at the story of the destruction of Sodom, look at this statement. It says, look at what it says here in, in, in Genesis chapter 19, verse 27. It says, and Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. Look at the two sentences. The smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. The smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. Even to the details about the smoke, it's hard to escape the conclusion that God is telling us as we look at this, this, this sentence against the mark, God is saying, look at Sodom and Gomorrah. If you want to understand the mark of the beast, God is saying, look at Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, this is what I saw in looking at it. Now, of course, we know that there are certain things here that are, well, everything is symbolic, right? It's not so much that God is saying, I'm going to burn people with fire and brimstone and that Jesus and the angels are going to be there. And it's not that he's saying they are going to be tormented forever and ever. God uses snapshots of statements from the Old Testament. So we can make a clear link in our minds with that particular passage. And if you want to, if I, let me remind you of, of, of how we looked at it. When it says the water of Euphrates was dried up, it was not a real water. It was not real water. It was people. And when it says it was dried up, it's not somebody mopping up water or pumping out water. It's people turning away from Babylon. And when it says to make way for the kings from the east, it's not kings from the east like, like people from earth. 
it's Jesus Christ coming from heaven. So everything has to be adjusted, but the language is there for we, so we can, can make a connection. If you understand. So interpreting the prophecies, it's not a word for word correspondence to what happened in the past. But the images and the pictures are there. So we can take the images and the pictures and grasp the idea. Now, there are so so right away, when I when I saw this, I began to think of why was it? What was it that caused God to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? And the Lord pointed my mind to another passage in the Bible. And I want us to look at this passage. Okay. Now I know that some of us are already familiar with this. Yeah, you have seen me go through this before, but I'm doing it again step by step because I believe that as we go through it and look at the evidences again, the strength of what we are saying is reinforced in our minds because there's a lot of biblical evidence. So while I might say I'm 90% convinced and I'm 10% in doubt, it's a small percentage because I can't answer every question about it. So I have a small percentage of doubt, but I'm 90% persuaded because of the evidence I see in the Bible. Now look at Romans chapter one, and I'm going to go down to about verse, maybe about verse 18. Now I want you to notice something. When I read about this tormented with fire and brimstone and all the rest of it, my mind turned to the sin of Sodom. And all of us know that the sin of Sodom is, was that they, they, they became, they were unrepentant and bare-faced homosexuals. They had no respect for God or for human decency. And they were open and bare-faced in their defiance of God and of heaven. They had become so fixed in their perversion that it was nothing for them to to, to attack two strangers that came into the city and for the entire city to come to rape the two men. Now, look at this passage in Romans 1. All of us are familiar with it, but let's take it again a little bit, step at a time. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Notice what he says. He says they hold the truth, but they hold it in unrighteousness. Why does Paul come to this conclusion? He says, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them or to them. In other words, the things that can be known about God, they know them. It has been shown to them, for God has showed it unto them. He's talking about the people of the world. He's not talking about Christians here. And I'll show you that in just a moment. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. You don't see God, but you see his creation is what he's saying. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and his divinity, his Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There's no excuse for not knowing God. There's no excuse for turning away from the way of God is what Paul is saying, because everything in creation is speaking to us. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. God revealed himself to them. They saw God in created things, but they did not glorify him. Neither were thankful, but they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So Paul says they knew God, but they rejected the knowledge of God. What did they do next? They, they, they pretended to be wise. They thought they were wise and they became fools. And their stupidity is revealed in that they change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. There is no clearer Bible verse that demonstrates the progression into the evolutionary thinking. People know God, they have the evidence of God, and they reject it. What do they do? Instead, they become evolutionists. They, 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 their God becomes no bigger than creatures and four-footed things and little creeping things. 
their God is the God of evolution, the God that says that we came from microbes and we evolved from all kinds of creatures, okay? That's their God because they thought they were wise, but they became fools. Clear as day, God identifies the great apostasy of our present age. But look at what happens next. Wherefore, or therefore, because of this, because they have become evolutionists and have rejected God, God also gave them up. When it says God gave you up a person, it means that God abandoned you. God left you alone. You say, okay, that's what you want. I'll leave you to it. God gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts or the desires of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Hold on, he's not finished. It says, who changed the truth of God into a lie? And worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Like I said, they don't normally bow down and worship wood and stone today. But they worship their, 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 their professors and their evolutionary theories and their science. And they serve the creature, the creation. They even, even say that the earth itself is some kind of goddess. But they completely eliminate the creator. It says, for this cause, because of this, God abandoned them, gave them up unto vile affections. The word vile means evil and debased affections, desires. Oh my goodness, I don't know if there's a better word to describe the perversion that has come upon those who have, who have gone in this direction. And Paul describes particularly how this, these vile affections manifest themselves. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one towards another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving, receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was fitting or which was meet. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, which are not proper, which are not, which are not, which are not proper. Yeah, the right word won't come to my mind at the moment. But anyway, read this passage and what do we see? Here's what I'm saying. According to this passage, what is the root of widespread homosexual behavior? According to the scripture, what is the root what is the cause of widespread homosexual behavior? Because remember, Paul is generalizing. He's not talking about individuals. I know and you know that there are some people who are tormented by, by inward desires from their very small. They don't choose this pathway. So I'm not speaking to every single person. Just like it, it wasn't every Pharisee that was a hypocrite. But Jesus says, all of you, you hypocrites, you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He labeled a class. It doesn't mean everyone was exactly the same. And that is what Paul is doing here. He's saying that when you find in a society that people reject God and they turn to evolution or they turn to the creature instead of the creator, the consequence is, the first and the most prominent consequence is homosexual behavior. Again, if anybody thinks I'm exaggerating or I'm misrepresenting what is being said, I'd like you to, to stop me. Now, this is the Bible. And so, so, so where do I go from this? I go back to the beast. Remember, the beast is a godless power. Remember, the beast persecutes the false religion and the true religion. So the beast is a godless power. I'm going to put it to you. That the, 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 the God of the beast is evolution. The beast represents the countries on this earth. Europe and America, the Western powers, the wealthiest countries in this world who have embraced evolution, evolution with all their heart, who have glorified and worshipped science and who are rejecting the knowledge of God. And if you want to see the connection, go to your Google 
or your Wikipedia and look at countries in the world that have legitimized gay marriage. Go and look. Go to the internet and just type in countries in the world that have legitimized gay marriage. And you will see something that will open your eyes. It is all the countries that have that have that have elevated the evolutionary theory. It's the richest countries in the world. It's America, it's Canada, it's it's Argentina, it's it's England, it's France, it's Germany, it's Spain, it's Holland, it's all of what we call the first world countries. They are the ones who have embraced this. And they are the countries, they are the most atheistic countries in the world. Do that as well. Go to, go to Google and type in most atheistic countries. And look at the percentage and you will see that it's jumping in your face. America, Canada, Australia, the first world countries. It's jumping in your face. You can't avoid it. The only, the only few people who are standing against atheism and the, the, the gay invasion are the poor little backward, uneducated, foolish, unlearned, unsophisticated countries of Africa and, 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 and some parts of, of Asia. And the poor little Caribbean countries are almost overwhelmed now, okay? We're too close to America. America is 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 over overrunning everything in their path. And the Caribbean countries are falling one by one. Okay. So so that's the second thing that I saw that was very striking. That the Bible identifies that the mark of rejecting God, the mark of atheism, then is the widespread adoption of the practice of the homosexual behavior. And when you tie that with the fact that the third angel's message is saying, when you look at the third angel's message, look at Sodom and Gomorrah. And what jumps out at you when you look at Sodom and Gomorrah? Homosexual behavior. You make a connection between the two things and you realize that the beast is a secular beast. And this is why in my thinking, I've come to the strong persuasion, 90%, that the mark of the beast has something to do with the, with the, with the gay, what do I say, gay lifestyle, not the gay lifestyle, the gay agenda, something to do with the fact that all over the world, the countries of Europe and America are pushing the gay lifestyle upon everybody on the planet while they're not compelling everybody to practice it they are compelling everybody to accept it right now the, the, the african countries are, are resisting they are standing up and they are complaining and they are saying you can keep your money we don't want your money the african countries are standing up but it will be interesting to see how long they are going to stand up because if this is really what i think it is the Bible says that the whole world will be brought to the test. To show you how alarming is the evidence, the, 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 the parliament in Kenya, how alarming is the, is, is, the, is the enticement and the compulsion. The parliament in Kenya and the entire Kenyan population is totally against the practice. But the, 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 the Supreme Court of Kenya approved that they, they, they made a decision that it is legitimate for gay lobby groups to be registered in Kenya. Caused a great outrage, even in parliament. They said they are going to overthrow it because the people in the Supreme Court must have lost their minds. But this is how, this is how it takes over the world. In Jamaica, there is, there is a, a Jamaican who has gone to live in Canada. He's a lawyer. Every, every year, he's bringing lawsuits against the Jamaican government. Lawsuits to, 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 to harass the government, to harass the courts, to make us change the laws in, in relationship to, to gays. 
every year. And they have endless money supporting them from the gay lobbies. They pump money into these things to make them come and bombard the courts over and over till they find the judges who will pass the laws in their favor. That's why those of us who are in disagreement, we can't, we can't stand against that. We don't have the money. We don't have the, 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 the persistence to bombard the courts year after year after year. So the Bible says that they will win because it is, it is a part of the process of bringing the world to the place where everybody is to be tested. And if you look at what is happening now, okay, it's not just the Anglican church. The, the Methodist church or a section of the Methodist church in America, Presbyterian church, all kinds of churches have now taken to ordaining homosexual ministers to accepting transgenders as, as um, worship leaders, as Bible teachers, all kinds of impossible scenarios that you never believe could happen. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's something that you asked me 20 years ago, I'd have said it is impossible. I would say nobody who believes in the Bible, nobody who claims to be a teacher of the Bible could ever stand upon and accept something like this. And brothers and sisters, before our eyes, we are seeing masses of Christians buy into the impossible lie that God accepts this kind of thing in spite of the clear biblical statements. And that is why I understand that this mark of the beast it is to be accompanied by a strange spirit where people take leave of their senses and they stop thinking and they move on in that path of darkness till they don't even have the capacity to reason anymore. So I'm going to look at, at one other comparison. I'm going to put up a chart. Let me put up my chart and then I'm going to show you some more evidence supporting what I just said. Now, what I have on the screen here is comparison between Romans chapter one and the statements that are made in the third angel's message. I have 12, probably there are about 14 of these, these comparisons, but I'm, I have 12 on the screen here. Let's look at these 12. In Revelation 14, it says the angel has the everlasting gospel to preach. Romans 1 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Notice it talks about the gospel. And let me put in my, not ashamed of the gospel. The everlasting gospel is to be preached. Revelation says, we are to fear God and give glory to him. In Romans 1, it says, when they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. The exact opposite. In Revelation, it says that the hour of his judgment is come. In Romans, it says that they, knowing the judgment of God, that they who do these things are worthy of death. They not only do them, but they take pleasure in those who do them. Revelation says, worship the one that made, heaven, that made all things, the creator. Paul says in Romans 1, they did not worship the creator, even though they saw the evidence. It says the one who made heaven and earth and the sea in Revelation. Here it says that God's power is revealed in created things over in Romans. Revelation, it says that they worship the beast. Romans, it says that they worship and serve the creature more than the creator. Revelation, it says that they made an image of the beast. Romans, it says they made an image of created things. Romans, uh, Revelation, it says that they had the mark in the forehead. Romans, it says they take pleasure in those who do them. So it's, it's, it's your mind is supporting them. You take pleasure. Revelation says they have the mark in the hand. Romans says they do these things. Revelation says that God's wrath is poured out upon, is poured out without mixture. Romans says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. And all of these are in Romans chapter 1. Revelation tells you in chapter 14 and 15, tells you about what is called the close of probation, the end of grace. Romans tells you the same thing. It says God gave them up 
to uncleanness. God, their probation was closed. God gave them up. Revelation 14 talks about these have the faith of Jesus and they keep the commandments of, of God. Romans 1, it says that the just shall live by faith. All right. You know, the truth is I am tired. I'm tired. I was over by the, um, the chapel this morning in face-to-face -face worship and I was standing up and I was talking and I think I wore up myself. So I'm extra tired this evening, but I think I've kind of covered what I am able to cover for this evening. There are still a few things that I haven't really finalized in terms of what I want to show you concerning this, but I think I'm going to stop with what we have covered so far. So what I'm saying really is that if you just take the Bible and you look at the points that I put together this evening, you may not agree with me, but if you are an honest person, you will have to agree that there is a strong case. All right? There's a strong case. So I will leave it there because I myself, I'm not going further than that. I have a strong case. And like I said, I'm about 90% convinced, but I leave room that by some amazing oversight, there may be things that are there that I've just missed all of us. So there's a 10 or maybe a 5% chance of that. But I've shared what I see and why I believe it. And so I hope that we have all been at least compelled to think about these things this evening. We will kind of complete the, 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 the study on the mark and the evidence next week.